Hello and welcome to Eat Your Backyard, my YouTube channel, where I talk about all kinds of edible things, as well as tropical, subtropical things that I'm really into. And I apply the practice of permaculture widely in my small Florida barrier island home, which is merely blocks from the beach. And it is fall. It is so nice. I mean, wow. Just incredible. We're here next to my beautiful chicken coop, which I'm quite pleased with. Welcome to the stream. By the way, if you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're already a subscriber, thank you very much. I would urge anybody who's not a subscriber to subscribe and join the journey. Hopefully you will be inspired and to apply these principles to your situation however you can. These are my sweet little hen girls, our little hennies, and uh, they have been producing so many eggs. And we've got our system continuing to evolve We've been utilizing the principle of, of observe and interact. That's a core permaculture principle, observe and interact. And I use that all the time. I've been using it with this system. You can see we've got this little, by the way, go Bucks. Coffee chat Sunday. We've been, you know, moving things around over the last couple of months since I built this to get a hang for how we want it to be in its final configuration. And this little doorway is the right place for the doorway, doorway, but it's not the right doorway. We're going to actually make that a full, probably five foot screened door right here, which will be nice. It's nice because the hens get to walk out to the front. They always want it if we're coming out or outside. They always want to see us and be close, it seems like so. This gives them an opportunity to not be all crowded up in the corner of that caged-in coop. Now in the afternoons, we've been just letting them out in the morning and letting them uh, free range in the little pasture we've got for them back there. And we actually take them, try to every day, take them back into this. You can see we've got a homemade roosting bar set up in there. That's a cool thing you can do with branches if you've got chickens, make a play area for them. But this area has really come in lush with grass due to all the bunny fertilizer and chicken manure. And uh, the chickens love to go in there and eat that grass. Luckily, it can grow almost as fast as they can eat it as long as we don't let them overgraze it. But they love that. You can see I've got a couple, a couple discount rack blackberry bushes that I placed here. This is something I like to do. This area, I'll back up, give you an update on what's to come. All right, so one of the things that I've really decided to focus on this year is to get into the uh, a node and a network of, you know, getting things I need in exchange for things I have. And so I have one of those going on. I'm going to have a beautiful Shishugiban woodwork artwork to put up on this fence here probably within the next month or so and uh you'll just have to wait to find out what that is i'm going to keep that a secret but the reveal so this fence is intended to enclose the bunny run here in the little little hay field we've got growing um, but it also creates another edge, and that's another permaculture principle that would be good to think about, which is that when you put up walls, when you have walls or you have the edges of your, of your property, that's an edge space. And in permaculture, they say utilize the edge spaces. You know, and that is such a cool thing to remember because we've all got them, edge spaces, and they can become incredibly productive. I just started to utilize an edge space on the other side of this bunny 
run in the space between my house and my neighbor's house, very kind of narrow space. And uh, <laughs> we had a wind event and it cracked down the moringa tree I had growing over here. It was the biggest moringa tree we had from grown from a seed. It just snapped it over and it snapped over the roselle, roselli that we had grown there too, the Florida cranberry. And so you learn about these edge, edge spaces that I'm sure it created some kind of downdraft within that gap and just drove those things, you know, to snap. So very interesting observation. Of course, no problem with either of those. You just snip off the part that broke and they're going to come back strong. Feed them some bunny manure. But utilizing the edge space. So I created an edge space by establishing this fence. And now I want to utilize it. And I'm thinking I'll do it with blackberry bushes. So I started with two. I always say buy lots of them if you can, especially when they were $5 a piece like these were. See, they have the, the <laughs> yellow tag on them. Always looking for the deals. And uh, I love blackberries. I've grown them successfully here, actually. You know, I've got a really sandy soil, but uh, they seem to like it. It's just they don't like the salt is what I found, but we're going to see. That's why I place them here. What I do is I, I observe and interact. I place the two plants here, I observe them, and then I interact with whatever happens. And because if they're going to do okay here with the salt spray amount that they get, then the leaves should not be turning brown or black the new growth should be fairly healthy if it's like getting brown like this one concerns me a little but i'm not sure uh, well i guess not too much most of that stuff was already on there okay that looks pretty good see i don't see any damage on that leaf so this is telling oh, but this one has a little brown on the tip Okay, so I'll watch the new growth and figure out, you know, there's no point in planting them here if they're just going to get fried by the salt. That's a significant factor in my yard because I, my uh, irrigation has salt and the wind has salt. And not everything likes salt. I like salt. So I planted so many moringa trees. I have really turned into a moringa nut um, overnight. <laughs> I planted so many moringa trees that having that beautiful biggest one snap over doesn't bother me at all. Man, my, hey, Kelly Hummingbird, thank you for jumping on the stream. Yeah, they're great. I love blackberries. I love raspberries too. I mean, we I am I consume in my diet a steady flow of blackberries and raspberries. They always seem to have them <clears throat> in the grocery store. Yeah. I certainly do love it also, and I've got it growing everywhere now. It is a chicken's favorite treat, let me tell you. They love moringa. And of course, if you're feeding your chickens moringa, you're giving them a high nutrient situation to say the least. Sometimes, sometimes I'll take off these lower branches, but you know why those are all, that's like that? Well, that's because chickens jump up and eat it. Oh, I see. Here's one. Oh, oh, got the whole thing. Good permaculture chickens. Now, I've been really making progress on the composting front. I'm excited to share that. First of all, my little composters are always at work. Look at these. Look at these hens. And if you can see that soil see how she scratches like that and then digs and pick they're turning over the soil constantly so they're composting at a rate i couldn't imagine i just am putting organic matter leaves everything from my yard in here as fast as i can throw it in there and uh, it's it's just getting digested now and it, they're turning it into this rich if you look at that into this rich combination i also have been infusing uh, a little bit of wood chips but, but wood, you know, I actually was watching the DTG video and saying, just throw it down, you know, just chop big pieces of wood, little pieces of wood, whatever, just get it on the ground, get it in contact with the ground so that it can be, you know, basically turned into soil. So I've been following that principle much more, not sweating the bigger 
pieces as much. You know, I don't want it to be like hard to walk over for me. But uh, yeah, I I'm just really stoked on this. Uh, I've been trying to use the a kind of version of the edible acres approach to chicken systems and uh, it's been working out really well. But look at this. My little work area. So the compost bins are just macking, overflowing the stuff and I'm continuously placing them. I'm down to a very small pile of leaves that I chopped off last night, but that represented a lot of work. I had laid down huge branches and let them sit there for a little while to drop leaves. And uh, they did. I'm getting ready to burn all this, create biochar, which I'll sprinkle everywhere. My little banana grove that I planted last week and actually did a video on that. And then I dropped a gigantic branch off of this thing that I trimmed directly on top of it, which is why they kind of look a little destroyed there in the front. But they'll come right back. Do not worry, especially the way I'm treating them. So here's what I did with these, with this new Cavendish banana grove that I planted. I like the Cavendish because of a few reasons. One reason is that they're widely available. Uh, second reason is they seem to be very disease resistant and, and uh, they seem to grow very rapidly. Third reason is that they don't grow very tall. Uh, they're over there in the corner, you can see it against a six foot fence. You know, that's about how tall they get when they're gigantic. That one in the center of the shot, that's a Cavendish, full grown Cavendish. When they, that's about as big as I've ever seen one get. So they're hardy fairly hardy and uh, they grow well. So I found some deals on them and I purchased one, two, five, <laughs> five Cavendish. Um, this little one back in there, this one, this one, this one, this one. And this is the way to establish a banana grove in case you were wondering, never just plant one banana tree. Please don't do that because you won't be stoked on it overall. You'll be better off if you plant a whole bunch of banana trees and then enjoy the banana grove experience, which is really bananas aren't about one plant, it's about a grove and you'll... Okay, went to Wi-Fi. Lost my signal there for a second. This whole area is going to be a banana grove, a low level banana grove, which suits me. This is the south end of the yard, so it's not gonna block the light really really stoked on that now a couple things i did this morning are going to make this new grove go off one thing is of course i added all of those leaves that you see around the base of these banana trees those leaves came from the longan tree right next to it and that makes an excellent excellent mulch excellent chop and drop nutrient return keeps keeps it moisture locked better moisture locked into that bed a lot better and it costs me nothing and uh, it, i love it so I actually would like a lot more leaves in there. The key when you do this kind of thing, in my opinion, is to have a depth of the things you chop so that it's deep enough to start some kind of composting process. It doesn't have to be crazy deep, but you know, if you have it six inches deep, that foot deep, that wouldn't be too much, I wouldn't think, because it quickly presses down if you, and then, to, then water it. But it, it quickly compresses down to the point where it'll be much lower than that. Hey, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, uh, Irid. I appreciate it. Thank you and welcome to the channel. I appreciate your visit. I hope you will subscribe because this is a glorious process. So the, the, a couple of things that, we, that I did today that are really gonna help this beyond the mulch leaves is the uh, application of about two weeks worth of bunny manure out of my two little lion head bunnies, which we'll go check out. By the way, they are the key, the animal component in your garden. If you want to have the real deal, you've got to get bunnies. <laughs> There's just no way around it or find a place you can get bunny manure or I guess guinea pig manure or whatever, but a super high from a reliable source. Okay. And that's the other thing, you know, some people I know use horse manure. Well, I would ask always 
what is that horse being fed? Because there are certain things that horses can be fed that you don't want to be putting in your vegetable garden. Coffee, sip, pause. Everything that comes out of my bunny, I put into it. <laughs> Maybe that's the t-shirt. Maybe that's the Eat Your Backyard t-shirt. Everything I put into my bunny. Yeah, well, what I put into my bunny is lots of fresh greens, fresh hay, nutrient-dense stuff. I just fed them each about six baby carrots a piece this morning. That was fun. Oh yeah, so we'll go over to the baby carrots here in a moment, the pineapple vertical tower gardening that I've got going here, which is so cool. Man, I love it. It's such, it would be such a great, actually, application for like people who are going indoors this time of year if you live in colder places and you have to go in, uh, inside to garden this time of year. The vertical grower, I think, is an incredible option. I'll show you what I mean. But the other two things that I did here was I unloaded uh, 10 gallons of prime worm tea, vermiculture worm tea, from my Red Wiggler worm farm and worm tea manufacturing system. <laughs> cost me about 30 bucks to put together. So, so, uh, I got a video on it in case you're interested. So I put all that in this bed. Now that's going to be very good for the soil health here or sand health really. And it's, you know, I, I may also go in here and sprinkle in some topsoil or, or some more enriched soil. Um, that's another option. But the point is um, the worm tea is just a gardener's gold really in my opinion and you set yourself up for success in so many ways now I grew pigeon peas in this bed earlier you know with the hopes to uh, affect soil health as well for a number of reasons I think that's gonna pay off so I've been restoring the health of the soil back here you know, dramatically and the, the worm tea is one way also keeping it watered, keeping it, but allowing it to retain the water, right? Again, the mulch. So the third thing I did to this bed to guarantee the success, and you can watch this hopefully over the years as the dwarf banana grove matures and it will grow quickly. So you won't have to wait long. It's not like watching paint dry, but the third thing is I applied bunny manure about two, about two uh, weeks worth of bunny manure. Yeah. So those three things, the mulch, the worm tea, the bunny manure, and uh, I and then I watered it in quite nicely. I really gave it a good watering. So I believe it's going to just absolutely go off here, and uh, we will see. But check out this vertical tower growing thing. This was so easy to put together. I paid more for this tower than I thought I should have. It's like sixty bucks, which to me, I don't know. I guess, you know, I suppose it's it's worth it. Depends. Get your perspective. So the pineapples that I've got growing in here are all doing well now. Even the ones like this one that had, sometimes when you get them at the grocery store, it's almost like the center has been, there is no center. It's just been pulled out or whatever. They all came back, the ones that were like that. And you could see, the very short leaves like they just grew back no problem even ones that had rather brown leaves what i'm looking at is this new growth in here they're definitely and here's another one that had a short inside to it quite interesting even the ones i just planted like that one seemed to be doing okay so this one had one of those broken off tops and it's doing about the best out of any of them i might take some of these older sickly ones out interesting because these are wild type these are the old school florida type with a serrated edge that's why i kept them but they are alive so who knows just don't have much faith in that one but yeah this is a great a great great system to have so all i really did was i bought this steak it's a hollow steak actually i realized afterwards it was hollow i thought it was solid so it's not that stable. This thing could get blown over easily in a windstorm. I probably should actually upgrade this to something like a piece of rebar. In fact, now that I think about it, I should. But anyway, over that, I put this piece of pipe that fits in the hole that goes down through all these. And uh, that's about it. I drove that, that stake pretty deep in the ground, put a 
sprinkler donut around the bottom and what that gives me is oh by the way the piece of pvc pipe on the bottom is way is bigger than the one on that runs through the middle so there's a piece that runs all the way through and then there's this one that rests and what that gives you is it's resting on top of a bigger piece of pvc it easily turns look at how easily that turns really cool in my estimation i just prepared this one for planting i'm going to plant a pineapple there that's where i took those carrots from and i've got to figure out another carrot area to harvest because these are all carrots i grow lots of carrots in pots and in different areas to feed the bunnies to feed the chickens everybody loves carrots including me you have some nice ones in there and they just grow like a weed so I've got to decide where the next area is that I'm going to sacrifice, and it's going to end up being these mint. Hey, so good gardener, welcome aboard. I appreciate it. Yeah, this was something I experimented with based on seeing it over at Funky Chicken Farm. And, uh, you know, she's got 10 of these, all hooked up with, with a uh, irrigation, automatic irrigation, I think, at one point, but and using mostly the, uh, you know, like non-soil things, you know, vermiculite, etc. So pretty cool. I think if you did this correctly, you could produce an incredible amount of food very efficiently with a small amount of space, which is what fascinated me about this. And it's, it's done quite well. I'm learning what is going to be adapted best for this space, though these pineapples don't require much much um, pot at all and i think they almost like to be a little bit root bound in my experience but uh, this is just can you imagine what this is going to look like when these pineapples are full grown you know it's going to be pretty cool so i'll slowly replace om almost well everything in there with pineapple plants and i can easily do that because i'm drying fruit all the time i bought this fruit dehydrator so i've been drying fruit and a lot of the fruit i just get from the grocery store but Got about four pounds of plums I'm getting ready to dry. Man, that's incredible. Yeah, and the bananas are doing well. Continue to watch them. And watched banana never ripens, but I'm watching the heck out of them. That's my dwarf Cavendish, so that's what's coming out of that banana grove in droves. And that's a musa. I don't know what I like more, the bananas or the blue sky. You see this, uh, this weeping tree. That's a strawberry tree, or what we refer to as a cotton candy tree. That one was grown from a seed, and this might be an interesting moment to just point out the growth habits of certain fruit trees can be affected greatly by whether you grow it from a cutting or you grow it from a seed. Moringa is like that. You grow it from a cutting, you get a much slower growth. Typically, must, I don't know if it produces in less yield, I don't know, but slower growth. Uh, if you get a one, grow, if you grow one from a seed, they generally just jump, it's super vigorous. So the vigor level is affected. Now this is a strawberry tree I grew from a seed, which is actually kind of an interesting thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. The seeds, because it's counterintuitive, the seeds require contact with sunlight to germinate. <clears throat> so uh, it's kind of a weird thing, but I grew that from a seed and it's just jumping up towards the sky. I've got another one I grew from a seed. I actually grew a bunch of them from seed in one pot and then separate them. This is the beginning of one that's also going to do quite well. It's in a more dry location, so it's not thriving as much. That one's more uh, watered. Check out the grow table real quick. See what we got going there. See what you got growing on. A few things staged and ready to go. These are roselli, roselle, which I'm going to plant. Um, yeah, you see that little croton? Grew that from a seed. I did some interesting things last year from experimenting. I planted a bunch of these Persian mulberry uh, cuttings, but then I didn't water them, so I'm not sure if they'll make it. Here's a 
Hey, SR1, good to see you. Here's a mulberry, ever-bearing mulberry, grown from a cutting, ready to go. I gotta decide where to put that. I've been wanting to grow a uh, down-by-the-curb mulberry. I just think that's kind of a cool thing to do. Like the curb pickable fruit. Here's another mulberry. Uh, tamarind. This is actually a royal poinciana tree, a flamboyant tree. Now, I've got to get my act together and get all these mango seed sprouts and put them into pots so that I can start growing um, seed, uh, rootstock. What I want to do is get about 10 or 15 mango rootstocks going. That gives me a good set to play around with grafting on uh, what I want to do is graft on Tommy Atkins branches onto this and try to get some more Tommy Atkins trees in my yard because that has been such a productive, excellent mango. The, the flavor is not like, you know, the fruit of King's level, like Hayden or whatever, but it is certainly good. And it grows so, so fast and it uh, doesn't get that big. And uh, Tommy Atkins for me is like a really good mango for the small backyard you're just guaranteed to win these are all moringa trees my plan is with those moringa trees was to plant them all in a rather dense circle you know less than a foot apart just kind of make a little mini grove i'm just deciding where to put that this is a persian mulberry tree which i love man the persian mulberry trees are the fruit is so good now take a look at this get a load of this if you look at videos on the channel from, you know, a year ago, year and a half ago, look at this. I need to go back and look at those videos, do it before and after. I should do a comparison of like, hey, look what, you know, two bunnies and a little bit of work will get you and all the other stuff. But, you know, it's just so lush and so dense with food, but also beauty before it was just a barren edge. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about lately, talked a little bit about it last week on the stream, was I'm so happy to, be br to have broken my dependence on granular lawn fertilizer, which contains herbicides, the ones I was getting. So happy. I don't have that anymore. This whole yard now is fertilized with bunny manure. I don't sweat the grass back here much. I just require it to be green enough, require it to be green enough to grow, to uh, run on for football catching. And also we let the chickens out here, so. Let's see, uh, I'm not sure on this signal if my how far I can get. If I lose connection, I'll be right back. It'll be because I got out of the range. Now let's do a little experiment. This is always a fun one for the coffee chat. I'm gonna do my, my chick calling. Yeah, chick, chick. There you go. Well trained chickens. It's probably one up there laying an egg, having an anxiety attack right now, thinking she's missing out on mealworms. Nope. Round the back. Just a slow to slow to the party. One positive development is that uh, they started to consume their oyster shell supplement more which was uh, something that you can actually get in chicken feed you know chickens require some supplements really to be healthy it's what i've learned grit which is like crushed granite and then there's uh oyster shell typically or just calcium supplement you know for their shells and their egg for their eggs but the oyster shell i got them they weren't really tapping on much with their beaks now they started to to eat it and i had a little issue with some soft eggs this is a very okay i'm going to tell you a little chicken story that happened over the last two days the last week or two 
we had I had some soft eggs. They were like soft shelled eggs, and like a few, a couple of them broke. And actually, I had one that had been pecked by one of the golden birds, and they should start to eat it. And we don't want egg eating birds. We don't want that for sure. So that was alarming, and also alarming. Why are the soft eggs? And one reason could be that they're sick. Another reason could be that it's some kind of stress. And the, they wouldn't always lay the. <laughs> they wouldn't always lay the. Uh, the soft eggs they would have some good eggs in between so it didn't seem like it was sickness you know and um, then we started to isolate the isolate off the barred rock birds th those are the black ones and feed them the black fly soldier larvae on their own to kind of supplement them and that i don't know if it helped but uh the point is i realized one night when i came out here that every time i came out here to look at night i would sneak up to you know shut the door or whatever if i came out after dark to shut the door on their coop. And uh, there would always be one barred rock not up on a roosting bar. And I always thought it jumped down. And then I realized the other day, oh, no, no, no. That barred rock never gets up on that roosting bar. Like These little golden birds and that one other are not letting her up there. So we always have one odd man out, one chicken. That must be super stressful. I bet it is super stressful to be de-roosted, you know? So, what do you think I did? I did exactly what you would have done. Oh, for heaven's sakes, come on. I built an additional roosting bar and I put two of them up on it last night. There it is, check this out. there the four by four enough roosting bar for all these birds but having that one you actually see more calm today than most days no cackle fest i'll probably generate one just by saying the phrase cackle fest you ready to do a cackle fest don't even cackle fest you ready to do a cackle fest don't even think you also notice i got some spider webs i gotta deal with it here when you have backyard chickens we removed this fence that was here i was you know one of the things is how wherever you're going to let the chickens go there's going to be the chicken manure left everywhere so how much do you let them have access to? But we just decided, well, this little corner. Hey. I'm making them excited. Yeah, so how much to restrict them? I think they're, I like, we like to have them have a little bit of running room. Yeah, I called them in, they got nothing. They're a little frustrated. It's interesting to see chicken psychology. If I give them something to be distracted with, they would just go in on that like a pile of pulled grass or whatever. I see them, they're going up in that coop. We've already gotten three eggs today, which is not bad. Three beautiful brown eggs. I can show you the, the bunny setup. We're gonna let them out too. I don't think I can get to them without losing my connection, but you see I'm in the process of transitioning the uh, this from this tarp configuration, I put it up temporarily to provide rain protection, but I'm going to extend the roof out in both ways. And also I'll build a better system here than this plastic, but that keeps the rain from coming in, you know, so they stay dry. Yeah, you know, I'm keep testing the Theory SR1 if my chickens understand English. They seem to understand it. Most of the time, I'm just telling them, be quiet. Yeah, so stoked on that chicken coop. Couldn't be happier. Also got on the regular rotation for cleaning it. What I mean is not sure how often, what's the right rate. And I think every, every weekend, I'm just gonna clean it out. And it's so easy to clean because I have this side door. I just lift it up and I made it so you can just put a large rake in there put a bin on the bottom, put a large rake, and just pull all the bedding out into this container. I take that container over and put it in the, in the 
uh, mulp, I mean in the uh, compost bins. And then uh, just push in fresh stuff. So it works great. It's really easy to do. And it produces, actually, you know, produces a, a very good product for my yard, which are, are, is the carbon in the wood chips, but also all the manure infused into it, which just makes it gold. You gotta compost that chicken manure though. Now look at how these hens love to scratch around inside that coop. They like that because as you can see, there's a bunch of mulch in there. Yeah, the girls seem happy. They're happier today. I think because they had roosting space. I really think that roosting bar is a good example of solving the riddle of this stuff. Which is as you're observing and interacting, you realize, oh, all of a sudden, ah, a light bulb comes on. They're probably stressed out. Th those barred rocks are, are sensitive to stress. I knew that because when we got them as chicks, they got, they got that pasty butt thing, which is a, usually the result of stress when we brought them home. Luckily, I looked up how to do that and we got them healthy again. But they were stressed out. The rooster that we had actually was like malnourished. I think he was on the edge of having a bad outcome. All of them came back and did great. But they were stressed. Those little golden birds, they weren't stressed at all. They were, they've always been like resilient, healthy, high energy birds, which they're, even though they're much smaller than the barred rocks, they are in charge. And the barred rocks almost, I think, uh, get intimidated by them quite a bit, even though they're smaller, which is interesting. But I think it stresses them out. And of course, not. I would hear a flutter, you know, it's all a flutter. I, I would hear them fluttering and like, you know, at night, sometimes at dark. And I would think, why are that, why are that chicken fight right at that point at night? Now it makes sense. They were chicken fighting to see who's odd man out, who sleeps on the chips. Nobody wants to sleep on the chips. So now they have a better bar. That's as much bar as I could possibly put in this in this uh, coop, too. It's the only place that I could reasonably do it. You don't want to put it in a place where they can poop down into their food or something like that onto their water, so it's got to be far enough away. So it's like the only sliver of space I could possibly put it. Out here in the daytime, they got plenty of roosting opportunities, but I'm going to be interested to see if I see any more soft eggs. I'm guessing I won't see any more, but we'll see. Yeah, it sure is a glorious morning. That's for oh, another update. Yes, a hat broke. Now it's a, it's an ornament. Hang your hat on the fruit picker. Caught some beautiful fish in that hat. <laughs> yeah, I do have a culturally diverse hen house. That's right. All right, this uh, pigeon pea has now got fruit starting to form on it, which I'm very pleased about. I'm going to greatly increase the pigeon pea count in my yard. Interesting thing is I planted those things everywhere and they only did well on the north end of my yard. And like they literally just slowly died in the other area. And I thought maybe well, I wasn't watering them enough in that spot. I just don't know. They just never did that great there. Something about it. And it might be that I over fertilized them or something. Man, I just didn't fertilize them much here. I don't really know the riddle, but I know luckily I have pigeon peas on both sides of this wall that are all fruiting. And uh, I'm just going to be harvesting and eating those peas, but I'm also going to be growing them. I'm going to greatly, greatly expand my pigeon pea thing. I might do a pigeon pea specimen out front, really try to get into it. I don't know. We're gonna see. You see that? I don't know if you can see the, this little stick of a tree. That's the mulberry cutting I planted there. And we're just we're just saying it's chickens versus the mulberry cutting. If it can possibly grow strong enough to get out of the tractor beam of the chickens' beaks. But uh, I think it's gonna win. I don't know. It's it's hanging in there. All the other ones, it's got two next to it that are sticks and dead because the chickens pecked them to death. But that's been the highest one. I think it might I think it might grow out of there. I've got a fun modification plan for this. I'm open to ideas if, if you have ideas. Um, the ventilation system here needs to be improved. The, 
This actually blocks more wind flow than I like. If I keep this east-west corridor open, it's gonna give a lot more wind flow through to the rabbits, which I like. You know, we have a thermometer in the rabbit run. We keep a close eye on it. And sometimes it gets hotter than I like. So we want to, what I'm planning to do is, I wanna remove these middle panels here. This is like some Mr. Rogers neighborhood stuff. Run a train set through there. But no, wait until you hear what I'm think we're thinking about. Take out this center area. Make it use use this as the screen ac across and then have from here over or a door in here be a drawbridge type of door almost, but have it be and so I think that's probably about three feet of space. Have it be a thing you can just fold down like this. That is also the wire, but in this case, it'd be like this type of wire that you could that chickens could walk on. And the idea is, and then also, okay, that is a chicken drawbridge into the grazing meadows, up and over, down off the bench, and into the grazing grounds. And they can easily get up there. They could fly up there, but. I thought I'd build a little chicken, a chicken walkway up to it and then train the chickens to come up the chicken walkway, down the drawbridge, into the grazing thing, and then back in. I think that'll be fun. <laughs> so we're, <laughs> I'm going to do it. Why not? Yeah, that'll be a big improvement. I thought about just getting rid of the fence panel altogether, but I kind of like the architectural thing, and I do like the edge space thing that it creates too. It's, it's kind of cool. And just structurally speaking, those rabbits, you know, are, are well caged in there by having this. On the other side, you know, there's wire on the inside of this. It's just worked functionally very well. So I think I don't want to get rid of the whole fence. But it'll be a sort of a unification of the rabbits and the chickens. They're already pretty unified. We also decided what we're going to do, I will say, what we're going to do for signage over the two areas. You know, I left this open. I don't like it with that rope there, but anyway, I left this open in order to have a the span covered with a sign. And so we're going to put the picture of a bunny, the outline of a bunny. And then here, we're going to just put across the front, which I also left that same gap this is intended to have a sign chickens chickens all across the front just the outline of chickens hello gerald friends yes thank you yes this is the uh we're going deep into the existential truths that are revealed by staring at a chicken and there are many I wonder, I wonder if my connection, all right, I'm going to try, yeah, hang on. I'm going to just try to switch over to turn off my Wi-Fi so that I know I can get to the room. Okay, looks like I have successfully bridged the gap. Hard at work. All right, let's see here. I gotta set the gimbal pan rate a little faster. Oh, oh no. Interrupted her. It's good to see that though, because that is one of the barred rock hens. I want to see continued improvement there. She's in there laying an egg. I won't disturb her privacy. Yesterday, one of the barred rocks laid two eggs. I didn't realize that was a thing until that happened. Let's see here. It is about time to let the bunnies out for their runs. 
Which bunny goes first? Th Thumper, the Brad Pitt of internet rabbits. I would say the finest internet rabbit. I'm counting on him to win the 2022 greatest internet rabbit prize. He uh, had a pretty good little snack of carrots not that long ago, so his eyesight should be excellent. <laughs> he hasn't been out here to see this new crazy roosting bar thing. Let's see how that goes. All right, I'm gonna pull him out. to get down all right I like to get the hop cam <laughs> the bunny run talk about Zen holy moly There's not one person I've had inside this bunny run that isn't like just blown away by the effect of hanging out with these bunnies. You can see I've got all these pieces of concrete around. It prevents him from digging out, but I like it because it also recycles stuff I would have thrown away, but creates an interesting little world for them to, to dig in. And even things like that little yogurt cup, they love to push that around, to give them things to you know, to investigate. You can hear him chewing on the sugar cane back there. There's a little sugar cane sprout that go chew on. Of course, they love the lemongrass. I mean, who doesn't? Listen to this. You're tearing into that sugar cane. They love to eat the sugar cane. It's one of their favorite things, of course, because I could imagine it's sugary. I'll be interested to see if that sugar cane actually lives through that. It might. A lot of times, Thumper will just pick a spot. It's cool, lay down. Oh, look at this. What a treat. Guest appearance. Holy mackerel. We got a universe occurring on this branch here. This is really cool. Let me. Don't want to disturb it. Okay. You can see the ladybug. There are two ladybugs crawling around. I don't want to scare them off. Hard to see. Yeah, there it is. Oh, no. Oh, it just flew up onto that other. There it is. Ladybug. There are ladybugs. The ti these are the tigers of the bug kingdom on this branch that has these ants. <laughs> Uh-oh, Cluckfest. 
has these little ant farms on here. They have that white stuff that they farm. And so there's a whole, a whole food chain occurring on this pigeon pea. I am absolutely stoked to see to see ladybugs. That's one of the happiest things I can imagine for a garden. And I think it's a sign of what we got going on here right now. I tell you, I've never seen more butterflies. I'm not exaggerating when I say Jack has gotten to the point where he can get the butterflies to land on his finger. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, it's insane. We can get these uh, chickens to fall asleep in our arms easily. That's why we're chicken whispers. Master the art of chicken relaxation. But that's really cool. Multiple ladybugs all over the pigeon pea. It's a good sign. Now, in case you're wondering, maybe, how big of a cutting you could take, well, with the Dracaena, I took about an eight foot cutting, maybe even a little longer. Here, you see this? All the way down to here. You can strategically place these, and typically they'll grow, but to get a structure up high right away without having to go buy a plant once you have them growing. And I have so many of them growing over here, of all kinds of varieties. They're, they're great functionally, but my point is that they do very well from large cuttings and will provide a structure unneeded for shade for whatever. This stuff all very good for mulch, chop and drop the leaves, very easy to process, looks beautiful. You know, the stuff they call lucky bamboo in the store, that's not actually bamboo, that's Dracaena, but you can see why they would start to do that. These plants tend to look like that. Start to, you know, this one doesn't exactly look like it, but certain varieties really do. But you get the idea. Very geometric plant, and look, it's alive. All the way out to the end, this part is still alive on this cutting. And new growth, healthy new growth. Now, the bunny manure, and the vermiculture sure have something to do with it. You can bet. But that just a, it's just a great way to get structure right away. One of the thing was, things was to make this area interesting and appealing to be in. You know, I think we're getting there. It's also fun to throw in things like this from time to time and uh, see what your animals do interact with it you can see thumper he hasn't really gotten too into getting out under it but they typically when they we take them out for their run in the mornings they um they typically just go eat lemongrass or sugarcane to start get their fill of that and then they'll go explore around go lay down much more happy with being pet they don't have an objective on their mind We've actually seen a wild bunny in the yard recently, which I did not like too much, but haven't seen really any effects of having the wild bunny in the yard yet, so. Sometimes we like to leave the bunnies out in this run for a little while so they can really get their digging time on. And um, I would not want to come realize I have a pregnant bunny, for instance. That could absolutely happen. But who knows what we would create the cross between a Florida bunny and a a lion head bunny. I mean, if you're going to get bunnies, why not get the cute ones? <laughs> They're all cute. <laughs> Some are really much more fuzzy than others, though. That's the truth. Thumper's gonna explore the, gonna explore the roost. That longan tree. Yeah, you like a hidey hole. You like to go under things. Sometimes they just like to chew on on bark. Too. I was wondering if they would be interested in that. 
I tried to trim this thing so it didn't have any places that the animals would get kind of easily hurt. So that's, should be able to. He's definitely interested in it. Back to eating grass. See that on his back paws like that? This is like the National Geographic of lionhead bunnies. We just observed their behavior in this artificial habitat. Simulated natural habitat. <laughs> so the question, the only question that really remains, and you can tell me what you think is, any additional rabbits? The third chinchilla rabbit was uh, certainly a concept, but probably a bit extravagant. Yeah, you like that hidey hole. That creates a nice little rabbit cave. Yeah, the forbidden hole. They were really going for the deep, deep regions on that hole there. What we, what I do is I just throw like miscellaneous pieces of concrete from broken edging and stuff in there into the hole, and then cover it back with sand so they get just tired of digging in it. So, <laughs> don't want it to become a hole for some other creatures either, so I got to actually fill it up. Yep, I, I'll tell you, it, time just flies by when you're watching a rabbit. It's uh, in a strange way fascinating. One thing that is uh, not to be over praised. Hey, Palm Nation's in the in the room. Showed up, ready to moderate. Look at that, empty, empty bins, just pressure washed them. What an incredible simple system. I'm gonna take out these things. They, they catch the miscellaneous ones that go astray, but I don't really need that. I've been utilizing that back area as a hay field. So I harvest it, feed it to the chickens. But yeah, that has just been so, so productive bunnies these two bunnies produce more than enough manure for my whole yard you just you know kind of go through each plant remember what the last one was that you fertilized today i went through and actually with the second i had two harvests of bunny manures one i put back in that banana patch the other one i took and put around a portion of it around each one of the, the fruit trees the rain had gotten into the bunny catching system and uh See how they like to, it's interesting. They'll actually push the ball over and play with it. And yeah, anyway, um, yeah, the water got in there, so it was kind of soupy, and I just poured into five-gallon buckets and then just poured around trees and then watered in, and, man, that's an effective way to go. But I put that a little bit of bunny good, not a little, decent amount of bunny goodness around each one of the fruit trees in the forest here. Oh, there you go. Woo! Did you see that? I don't know if you could hear that, but he thumped, and that's why we call him Thumper. Sometimes he'll just thump and take off. Pow! Go on a run. Rabbit sprint. It's good to see him do that. I like that. Sp 
Yeah, dude, I would, oh, that's killer, Gerald. Yeah, you should definitely do the bunnies, man. Uh, I wouldn't combo it with the chickens at first. I would get one system in and then go to the next. And that's what I did, and it was a lot to do both of those, actually. Oh, no. Tornadic winner. That sounds like a heavy metal, Ben. Tornadic winner. Well, yeah, just get the bunnies up and running. The bunnies are so simple, so simple. I should I should have videotaped the setup they have over Funky Chicken more, but on that video where I go to that Funky Chicken farm, show her setup, which anybody could do, and it's really efficient and inexpensive, which is to just have those those uh, you know large bunny cages up on up on the stakes with a you know the pan like I've got under it. I mean, you don't have to make a lot of carpentry to it, but if you want to go for something, you know. Um, Architecturally cool, I certainly think that's a good way to go, too. That's the way I want to go. Sniffing the morning breezes. It's good to get them out here this time of the day. They still have a lot of natural rabbit energies occurring. In the afternoon, they just get very sleepy. Come here, Thumbs. Come here. Come on. That's it. Yeah. You want to. That's a good Thumpy. I knew you would. interesting they will actually come to you now but they come to their in their they come to you in their own rabbit way <laughs> he loves that hole still thinking maybe there's a way oh you don't get the true winner yeah just occasional frost that's enough frost to, uh, you know, maybe bum you out if you got anything outside. We're counting on no frost this year. All, always above 32 degrees. That's what we're counting on. And, you know, in zone 10A, we should be able to accomplish that. The reason we can be in 10A and actually be this far north is just that we're right along the coast here. And we're surrounded by gigantic bodies of water that regulate the temperatures quite effectively. I forget who it was on the stream that said, you know, essentially uh, rabbits are athletic guinea pigs. I love that quote. But yeah, we're, we're actually considering the th a third rabbit, a, ch a chinchilla rabbit, which are, they classify as meat rabbits, they're these big rabbits. Again, it would just be additional bunny manure. But honestly, probably better just to hold it too. <laughs> yeah, if Canada was an ocean, you'd be in zone 12. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we got a football game today we're very excited about which is the Buccaneers versus Dolphins. All Florida game. Have friends that are Dolphins fans. And I am, of course, a Buccaneers fan. Yeah, I think this thing enriches their little habitat here quite a bit. And I am very curious to see if they're gonna chew on that wood, on that bark. Oh, that's the rabbit lunge. They call that the rabbit lunge, where they stretch their front paws way out but keep their back paws fixed.
that's bunny butt. They call that the bunny butt. Where they turn and just <laughs> face their butt too. Did you see that? Did you see the thump on the way out? Yeah, the bunnies have all these interesting things they do, like the flop, the bunny butt. Oh, excellent. Yeah, oh, wasting the turds the whole time. Oh, wow. There you go. Eating up that sugar cane hay. I just throw that hay down on the ground. They love to eat that too, which are the dried leaves of the sugar cane. Very interesting. Yeah, I think that bunny's starting to fall prey to the winds, the relaxing property of the winds. Now, be you're next. She's really a big rabbit, but I don't think she's fat. I don't think she's overweight for her size, but hard to say. We're trying not to get him to that state. It's not good for him. Hey, Gardner Twitty. Good to see you. Everything's doing well this morning. Yeah, I appreciate you asking. It is a beautiful, beautiful fall morning here in Florida, that's for sure. But everything's going well out there in Texas. You can see this bunny knows what's up. Actually, I can, I can put up this rain shield. It's not gonna rain today until later. It is going to rain today though. Hey, Penelope. Hello, Sirius. Good to see you on the stream. Welcome. She is a serious, you know, level five fool for petting. Oh, wow, that's cool. You should post that, the video. Did you post it yet? I'll go check it out. Ah, excellent, excellent. Gotta get the harvest on, that's for sure. I just harvested bunny turds this morning, mostly, and worm tea and stuff like that. No real fruit, but I do need... Oh, okay. Well, let me know. There, Palm Nation. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I noticed you're the banana pup aficionado. Yeah. Oh, dude. Gardner Twitty, you got to get a bunny system in your setup, man. It's the animal piece of the puzzle, but it, it's going to, for me, changed everything. Turbocharged everything with nutrients. I just cleaned out their uh, the catchers I use. But um, this, this one change above the chickens, above anything else, any plants, anything I did here, the one change of getting the bunny manure flowing into all areas of my yard all the time, including I fertilize the lawn with it. I fertilize every single thing with it. It changed the whole equation. Yeah, we love these bunnies. Nice, banana jungle. That's really cool. That's what you need. You know, that's where how it's intended to be is the banana jungle, not just one banana tree. I say that all the time, but look at this rabbit, it's falling asleep. It gets so relaxed. If I wait too long, it's not going to want to run around. Oh, no animals. Not even chickens? You can't even have chickens where you're at? And by the way, I think it's insane that 
you can be restricted from having chickens. Oh man, Cluckfest. Cackle fest? No. I hear you. I don't hear you. Where's my little... I call this my feet flock. They just follow you around everywhere you go. Yeah. The idea that you would not be allowed to have chickens is insane, I guess. <gasps> Holy moly. I think... The barred rock laid two eggs again. Now, this is risky business trying to go in there with one hand. I don't think I'll try to balance three eggs. Maybe I'll try to balance it. Look at that one. That's a barred rock egg. In fact, I'm pretty pleased with the look at that. Remember, these are the ones I was a little concerned about. All right, that's one. Well, that one looks really good, too. Look at that. Yeah, I think those little barred rocks were just, were just stressed out. Now there's a golden bird egg. Thank you, you're gonna fly up there, aren't you? I know. All right, I'm not gonna try to, I'm not gonna try to carry those in one hand. I'm gonna leave them in there. That's encouraging. That's five eggs today. Or is that six eggs today? That could be six eggs today. Now that those barred rocks are laying two eggs a day some days. I have no idea that... Oh, look at this. My wife just came out here, obviously, and threw him some treats. Hey, sweetie. Yeah, look at this day we got going on here. I do have to get some football food today. In fact, and I also need to repaint this deck. I'm gonna go with green, like this color green, not that color green, like dark green, right in here. Yep, anyway, I'll repaint that, but I gotta decide, football food. Do I bust out the smoker or not? Man, I'm so stoked on that. Love to see the, the egg situation getting dialed in trimmed up this coconut, this dwarf coconut the other day. Got rid of some of its initial growth. I like to leave the initial growth on there as long as possible, but I just couldn't tolerate it one more second. It was kind of still yellowy. Just gave this thing a mega batch of bunny turds. And it's, uh, it's been predicted by me that this is going to give me amazing coconuts within two years. Gardner Twitty, yeah, get the smoker out. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, honestly, football's really just probably an elaborate excuse to use the smoker, to be honest, and hang out with the family. It's really all it is. But I love it. I love it. I might, um, hmm. Oh, it's getting cold there. It's getting much cooler here, too, even in Florida, although it's not nothing like where you are, but just we dropped below the furnace level, and now we're just into, um, you know, we're out of boil and into simmer. Yeah, James Palms, the way James Palms protects his Robusta, that is incredible the way that dude does that. That is something else for sure. He builds a structure around it. That is super cool. Yeah, you could probably do that serious, but do the James Palm, you know, build the thing around the thing uh, method. He, it's really cool how they go kind of dormant like that. And, uh, you could definitely do that with a coconut tree. Just have to have a giant box. 
He puts the Christmas lights around it too to keep it warm. The thing with the coconut tree is get the dwarf one. I just say it all the time, get the dwarf coconuts. They produce the fruit a lot more quickly. That's why I know I'm gonna get fruit off of this in a couple of years. I think the fruit tastes better. You know, coconut aficionados don't kill me. And of course they don't get as tall, which means the fruit is pickable. It means that you also don't have you know, the hazards of the incredibly tall trees. Geez, I had told a friend of mine I was gonna go surfing with him, but I think I'm just gonna blow that off. Now I've got smoker on my mind. I think it's time to get serious and plan out what we're putting in the smoker for lunch. Even though I won't be able to slow smoke it. Hmm. I actually have some mango, ghost pepper mango hot sauce that my neighbor uh, right over here made with peppers on the other side of that fence and using the mangoes off of this Tommy Atkins mango tree. And um, it's without any doubt the best mango hot sauce I've ever had, nothing even close. I never imagined that a hot pepper could actually, the experience of a hot pepper could be like that. And I don't mean like, the intensity is really strong if you have a lot of it, but the slow pace at which the hot pepper heat turned on and the, the, the heat, the characteristic of it, the hot food characteristic of it was just very unique. I loved it. And that made me decide to grow hot peppers. So I give, I'm giving it a try. Actually, a buddy of mine gave me the date, this datal hot pepper plant. Jack and his buddy ate one, and then we went and looked it up. It had a Scoble rating of like 8,000. Super hot peppers. Not ghost pepper level, but very hot. And these little guys will uh, brighten your day up for sure. I should probably dry them. Throw them in the dryer. Start using them like that. Dried pepper. It's just... Man, if I, I know I had it in the shade, and it was doing okay, but... Just peppers have been so problematic. They really don't like the salt spray, which is why I've got them off on this side of the yard here. They're just more likely to survive. And I might be doing my harvest video for the uh, bananas here real soon. Real soon. That one is almost ready. We love, we've been doing banana harvest videos for years. That was one of the old Eat Your Backyard <laughs> videos. It was the famous uh, leaping cut of the banana flower. The cherimoya tree, man, it, I was curious of where to plant this thing for a while, and I finally decided this is the spot. This is where it's destined to be, right in the backdrop of these bananas and giant Hawaiian papaya and so on and so forth. This space of yard has still got a lot of light most of the time, so it's going to get a lot of light. I put it here for about a week and just watched it to see if it would um, if it would show burns, and it didn't. Didn't show any negative signs, so in the ground it went. And wow, stoked on that. Now look at this. That's what I'm talking about. You can see that that moth, butterflies, moths, <laughs> ladybugs. Seeing the insect life happen. Now, one thing I saw decrease, and I mean dramatically decrease in my yard, which I had had in my yard forever, were lizards. <laughs> the lizard population, the li I can't. I couldn't find a lizard if I went searching for one in this yard now. And I do believe the chickens ate every single one of them. Yep, I think they ate up those lizards. And that's just the way that goes. And uh, they eat a lot of bugs. For sure. 
My next sourcing thing is to get flaxseed. Oh, oh, I'm on the, on the uh, process now of getting flaxseed into the diets of these hens. I just wanted to get their soft shell thing dialed in first, but now that that's all settled, I believe. Yeah, I wanna start feeding them flaxseed, which makes the eggs contain omega-3 fatty acids. You can have omega-3 eggs. So the four types of eggs, these are three of the, these will be three of the types, which is uh, actually all four of the types, which is the uh, grain-fed, the pasture-raised, the uh, organic, and omega-3, which are about the healthiest eggs you could possibly have in your diet. It's something like the perfect multivitamin, along with plants that are like the perfect multivitamin. If you're incorporating these things in your diet, I claim you're gonna be healthier. Pragmatically speaking, that's a good reason to do this stuff. This is the this is the plant equivalent. I think if I came out here and broke a leaf off of here every day and ate one, I would be a healthier human being. And pretty soon I'll be able to do that. I've been doing it with Roselle quite a bit. Coming out here loaded with antioxidants, vitamin C, all kinds of good stuff center of the flower loaded with pectin the roselli is just outstanding look at this thing hibiscus like the look of that Let's see if i can break it off and keep it intact oh, i broke the stem Uh, that was the foul. There we go. That was messy. I should have used a clipper. Oh well, the result was good. It's a Roselle. Now this tastes just like a cranberry. And after all, the channel is called Eat Your Backyard. You crack off the petals, as you can see the inside. And here's what the petals look like. Now they dry these and use these in teas. They taste wonderful. Um, they're very crunchy, almost the consistency of, a, of celery in a weird way, but not no fiber in it. And they taste just like a cranberry, very tart and sweet. Mmm. Man, I love them. I'm never gonna not have Roselli in my life now. So I'm out here eating one of these a day for sure. Look at the color of that. They almost have an earthy taste to them. Yeah, they're so good. And no bugs. Oh, I say that and then I just found a little ant. All right, so not many bugs. Oh, persimmons, nice. Yeah, I'd love to, have, I have that chocolate pudding, but I'd love to have some persimmons. Now this thing, loaded with pectin. I'm not gonna harvest it, I'm just gonna put it back into the, the fray, but yeah, the other thing is loaded with seeds, which will grow very easily. So hopefully I can get this one to produce, you know, full mature ones if I don't eat them all. But if I do eat them all, I can just order another seed pack right off of the interwebs. Yeah, very pleased with that location. You can see I'm tightly packing in trees here. You know, managing the light and the canopy very carefully to achieve certain things here, but 
Packing them in. I do not want to sacrifice this light corridor I've got down the center. I think that's one of the architectural elements that makes this whole setup work is to keep that center open and keep the south end open so that we continue to encourage a flow of light. You know, you lose that light, you're going to lose the capability to grow a lot of stuff. If you look at this area, that's good. Now the sun's in a certain spot. You can see the results of me trimming that longan tree, did a drastic trimming of it. And what do you see now? light coming through. This was absolutely shaded. All right, so you can see the, the shadow contour of that tree. It's the southern yeah, end of my yard, but you know, so the sun is now this time of year just starting to go down on the horizon a little bit. And so the light that's cast is this area. And I'm not done trimming it yet. I'm actually excited to be able to harvest some more of these leaves because I really love using these for, check out the leaves that come off that long tree. They make excellent, excellent chop and drop because they interweave together and kind of lock in place. And then as they decay, they kind of stay in the place where you put them. I like that. But as you can see on this tree, I uh, dramatic cuttings. And I'll do this in phases because, you know, quite frankly, I can only handle so much. And I had to, it's time to do a fairly radical trimming on this one. So I'm getting it done, but you can see there's really only two branches that are left. This, this one here and then this one here. I'm going to get both of those and then the whole thing will be down and managed. But it's going to just blow up with growth because I'm going to be, I'm feeding it bunny manure. In fact, I just gave it a big dose of bunny manure this morning. But I have to do that because it was getting tired. It was way too tall to get to the fruit and it wasn't producing like I wanted to. So I need to reinvigorate it get it to where I can deal with it. But it was also shading everything out down here and we can't have that. So now for the first time, this area is a little brightened up. That means we'll have grass growing in here again. Grass just won't grow underneath, underneath the shade of a dense, dense shade canopy. So, and I tolerate it, you know, that's why I tolerate it here, but I like to have grass out here. Again, this grass is totally fertilized by bunny manure. So that's what the bunny manure gets you. If you figure how much do a couple of bunnies cost you, what do you get from them? Well, I got my bunnies for $65 a piece and they were like the fancy bunnies, you know? But if I wanted to get the, if I wanted to just get the meat bunny type, I could have got them for $35 a piece. So let's say you just, and they're big ones. Those are the ones that get to be 12 pounds. So they really crank out the fertilizer. If you got two of those, you can get the cages set up realistically on the cheap for a hundred bucks. You'd have a tarp, the cages, the stakes, the everything, and the pans. hundred bucks, you got them, cage, you know, cage. And then how much is food? Oh, look, do you see that butterfly? Do you see that monarch butterfly? Uh, this is what I'm talking about. Constantly butterflies flying around back here. I mean, all different types. Anyhow, that was a butterfly commercial. How much does it cost to feed a bunny? Well, I get the $10 a bag bunny food at Tractor Supply, and that lasts a month for the two bunnies I have. But I'm, and then maybe a little longer. I also supplement it with lots of stuff I just chop from the backyard. They're eating mulberry leaves and branches all the time. They're eating all kinds of different leaves and vegetables. You know, like today they had carrots. We're always bringing them out things left, you know, things that from uh, scraps from vegetables from the things we eat. So they eat well and diversely. But for that cost, the maintaining and like let's say you have you know twice the the bunny feeding needs of me that would be uh, twenty dollars a month for twenty dollars a month you paid for all your fertilizer for your lawn your plants and every that's twelve times twenty yeah so that's not much you know a few hundred bucks you're in in the goodness easily for having the turbocharged yard the only other thing I could say is you know. Uh, comparable to that is uh is chickens perhaps but it's just 
much more complicated, much more complicated to get the chicken manure into a useful garden product than, in my opinion, although it, there are ways to optimize that certainly if you're an expert, but I'm not yet, than the simple approach of a cold fertilizer like you get from bunnies. You could just apply it directly to your stuff. Right away it's going to take effect and uh, it doesn't smell, doesn't have a lot of problems uh, managing the bunnies. It's just so easy. It's the number one thing you can do for your yard, bunnies. Well, okay. Hey, I appreciate everybody jumping on the stream. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. That helps. Also, if you want to support the channel, just anytime you go to Amazon to get a thing or something, just go to the any of the videos on Eat Your Backyard. Click on one of the links there to Amazon. Those are to the seeds and plants and cuttings that I point out. And uh, that's an affiliate link. Eat Your Backyard gets a small donation and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Okay, so that's that. Also, a quick update, t-shirts coming. I decided to go with a t-shirt. So if you have t-shirt ideas, please express them in the comments of this video. I'm super stoked on ideas of that. I kind of look at a t-shirt as like a one day tattoo. So let's, I'm serious about it. <laughs> but eat your backyard t-shirts. Just in time for the holidays. <laughs> yeah garden twitty excellent comment you've heard you can use bunny manure directly after they drop that's right you can use it immediately straight out of the bunny into the garden and uh there's no delay needed whatsoever that's why they call it a cold manure as opposed to hot manures which can burn plants if you apply them directly without composting them so Uh, yeah, so that's the, for me, the real reason you want to have the bunny manure. Um, yeah, AZ Gardener. Thanks for joining the stream. Yeah, I am in Florida. I'm in zone 10A in my little barrier island uh, permaculture food forest. Yeah, exactly. All you got was a t-shirt. It better be a good one. I'm clam because I'm putting a lot of thought into this T-shirt, so hopefully it'll be a good one. We'll see. We will see. But anyhow, so the the uh, yeah the bunny manure you can apply directly to your plants, and there are only a few other animals like that that are practical to use for this kind of stuff. Oh, thank you very much, Az Gardener. I appreciate that greatly. I hope you will sub, so we can do this more often. But uh, guinea pigs are another way to go. Guinea pigs will produce a similar kind of high nutrient fertilizer. But I mean, really, honestly, if I were to give you a multiple choice and say which animal would you rather spend time with, and the choices were rat, guinea pig, rabbit, you know, you're picking the rabbit every time. Rabbits, I mean, what's cuter than a rabbit? Here's the other thing about a rabbit, it's not a rodent. So you got that going for you. Here's another thing about a rabbit, they're vegetarians. So don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Another good thing about a rabbit, they don't smell. And I mean, if you've ever put a rabbit up to your face and taken a deep breath, sniff. You can't smell it. It's like it's not there. They're incredibly clean. Incredibly, I mean, I wouldn't put it in my mouth, but they're very hygienic in terms of they keep themselves from smelling like anything because they're 100% a prey item. And I'm sure if they, if they uh, smelled, the prey could find them. Gardner Twitty, yes, rabbits. Do you eat them as well? I don't eat them, but that's another great benefit of rabbits is that they are absolutely excellent excellent meat product yeah absolutely i mean a, a they're little i would say chickens might be easier for that by far actually but 
Um, yeah, the, the meat bunnies, I mean, they get to 12 pounds in something like three months, I believe, 12 pound bunny. That's, that's a lot of, it's a lot of protein on the homestead, so to speak. So I think that's pretty cool. You know, there's a stigma on eating rabbits probably in the United States because it's not seen as livestock, it's more seen as a pet. But uh, we, you know, all of our stuff are just pets. The chickens, we just have for eggs and the bunnies just for the manure. They're more like, uh, you know, an important puzzle piece of our system that continuously gives us stuff that we need. And we're under strict regulations here in our place where uh, only bananas, welcome. Don't grow too many of the what? Yeah, the, the uh, I, I'm not allowed to process any animals for meat on where I'm zoned here. So I couldn't do it even if I wanted to. So I don't. But if I had property, I would absolutely be growing chickens for meat. Absolutely. I think that's one of the most amazing things you could do if you have property would be to have a period of time where you raise a hundred, say, you know, leghorn chickens, some like fast growing meat chicken, and you just feed them day and night, good stuff. And um, yeah, a hundred chickens fed the right things in a very nutritious, humane way. You could produce a very high quality protein source for your family and stuff. And you know, you see farms that have done this forever. This is a mo one of the most natural human things you could do is to go harvest a thing like a hundred chickens and turn them into, you know, something that the whole family or whatever can benefit from. It's one of the coolest things you could possibly do. And it's intense. I mean, the first time you see it or do it, you know, it'd have to be exposed to that level of, of, uh, yeah, yeah, that level of connection with what you're growing. But I think it's essential. It is essential. All right, well, I'm going to jump off. I appreciate you. Have a great day. Thanks for watching. Eat your back.